Grace and peace to you from God our Father, through Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. <clears throat> the Gauls were a barbarian clan back in the Empire of Rome, and when they would come to invade the northern part of Rome up in the French Alps, they would come down out of the mountains making horrendous noises, and actually they were, actually some theorists have, uh, have credited them to be kind of the first snowboarders, because they literally would take their shields and ride down the mountains at the Romans, um, much like the Olympics, uh, without helmets and scores. But the thing about the barbarians that made it kind of interesting and, and, and weird on some level, the Romans hadn't seen this either, is that soon after the men would slide down the hills to go to battle, up on the hill the Romans would see wagons of the barbarians' family following them. And they would come and they would make a long line with these wagons. And it would be the wives there with their children waiting and watching this battle. And at first the Romans had no idea what was going on. Maybe they thought that because these, these barbarian tribes were a bit nomadic, that these families were traveling together into battle. And the wives and families just wanted to see what was going on. Well, it wasn't until their first battle with the Gauls and making the barbarians retreat back up into that line that they realized what this wagon trail was all about, what this wagon line was all about. As the soldiers would run up this hill and retreat from the Roman Empire, the wives would start to get off of their wagons with axes and swords and wait for their husbands to come back. It was indeed a no retreat kind of thing for the barbarians of Gaul. There was no other option except to fight that battle. We know this more and more is a part of war, especially as we've got into more of a documented war like World War I, where we hear of all the different factions, France, England, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Russia, all of these major powers that enforce this type of law within their armies, this idea that if you did not go and face the enemy, if you turned and run, in fact, if you went into what we would consider a state of shell shock, an idea of our bodies giving up, we were subject to be shot by our own people. There was no option for those soldiers in those trenches, even as those mustard gas, poison gas would creep across the field, there was no turning around, there was no retreat. If we were to go back 2,600 years and go into the kingdom of Judah and find somewhere in a dark room, we would find a 17-year-old boy huddled down probably crying. <laughs> Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Jeremiah was known to be a boy prophet as well. He was believed to be about 17 years old when called into his prophecy, when called into this word of Judah, this word that overtakes him, this word that consumes him. You see, at the time, Judah and the people of Judah, the leadership of Judah, what they were doing is they were going to other places, to Greece, to neighboring countries, and they were going and worshiping other gods. They were going and pledging allegiance to other gods for the sake of business. This sounds familiar. For the business person that goes across the seas on an overseas trip and tries to consume and be a part of every custom and every Japanese custom or Chinese custom or Russian, and tries to become like them, tries to, to buy into their system with the hopes that they can on some level patronize their client into signing a contract. They lose themselves. They lose part of who they are. They lose part of what God was making them to be. And this was happening in Judah. These leaders, these religious leaders that had been appointed to be certain people for God, certain people for the midst and the people of God, and they were selling their rights to someone else. They were becoming somebody else. And what Jeremiah had for Judah was not a word of hope. You see, this three weeks, the next three weeks that we have is, is a part, it's, it's a series almost on some level, a sermon series, an idea that we have been freed in Pentecost to tell others of Jesus. We hear of how the tongues of flames of, above our own heads, that we each have been become, we each have been bestowed as ministers. We each have been told the word of God to tell the others. And then the next week, we hear how the Holy Spirit in the Holy Trinity is promised to us, is promised to journey with us, is promised to go with us, is promised to know us. So we know we have company in this. We know we have a journeyman with us. 
And then we come to this week. This is the calm before the storm. This is sitting in a locker room before playing the number one seeded team and we are the number 300 seeded team. This is looking out into the world and saying it is not good. What we face is insurmountable. What is coming to us is overwhelming. This is the sermon that tells us about the realities of our journey. This is the text that Jeremiah screams out into the world, the only thing that is coming is destruction and violence. Can you imagine that? Imagine sitting in Jeremiah's shoes. Imagine God putting it in your heart and in your mind to tell your friends, your loved ones, your brothers, your sisters, your mothers, your fathers, that what is coming for us will destroy everything about us. That it will destroy our temples, our churches, our homes. That what Babylon is coming in to do is to take away our families, to rape our women, to take our children and put them into slavery, to take the men and take them into our own ranks of armies, never to be seen again. This was utter destruction. You see, the truth about this waters, too, the truth about these waters is that once we have been sealed with the Spirit, once we have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection, once we have seen a new life and can no longer live any other, we now must face the realities of the path in front of us. And the reality of that is that it is hard. I get sick in my stomach when I hear preachers, be it on the television, that want to sit here and tell you that if you have faith, if you just have faith enough, if you just pray enough, if you just give enough, if you just do enough, that somehow your life is going to turn out just fine, that everything is going to be easy for you, that you will not face any kind of trial or tribulation. We all know that that is not the truth. For each one of us have come here, and each one of us face our own battles. Each one of us face our own struggles. And that's what we hear Jesus talk about today is that this hardship, this path, this journey that puts before us where we will go and become a mockery, where people will laugh at us, where people will not believe us, Jesus doesn't even give us the safety of our own homes. He says, yes, I will even call you into your own home to tell this word. We each have been put in between that inevitable rock and a hard place. <laughs> We've each stood in the footsteps of Hunter as he watched me going, oh God, please don't really do this. How many times have we had that? How many times have we looked at a relative or a loved one and had to tell them something that we just couldn't utter out of our mouth? How many times have we looked at someone and maybe said, maybe that drink is too much, maybe that bottle has become a problem. Maybe it's time to leave. Maybe it's time that death has come for us. Each one of us has been put in a situation where there is no retreat, where there is no other option, where there is no easy way out, where there is no hopeful way of looking at things. This is the anti-optimistic text, but this is the reality of it, is that Christ tells us that the more we try to do for ourselves, the more that we try to claw and spit and fight for our life, within our own context, the more that we try to take on that wheel and bump God out of the way and say, I got this, I'm strong enough, I'm smart enough, I can do this, my will, my way. Jesus reminds us that it is in that moment that we will lose our life. You see, what happens in those moments, even if it's in our best intention, is that we lose track of the one thing in our life the one thing that can pull us out of eternity, the one thing that can save us in eternity, and that is God. You see, our efforts, even our greatest efforts, will fall. Our greatest buildings will fall. I love watching that show. You may have caught it on uh, Animal Planet, or uh, yeah, I think it was Animal, or Discovery, but that what happens after we're gone, I'm pretty sure I've watched that title, but it was basically the idea of what nature is going to do to us to this place after we're extinct, if we ever go extinct, and what happens. And it showed how, this, how vegetation would grow over buildings and rust would eventually wear away b uh, bridges. That even our greatest monuments, these, these towers of 
kings and pharaohs that, spent, that we spent hundreds of years building will all one day become dust. That's exactly the word that Jeremiah had to say. And that's exactly what Jesus is telling us, that if we continue to live a life only with our own will and our own way as our beacon, we too will be nothing more than just dust. You see, the truth of Christianity, the truth of these baptismal waters, these truths that Paul tells us about the being baptized into Christ's death and resurrection to have a new life is that we can no longer live in a small way. We can no longer just look at the thing in front of us, look at our path in front of us, just these three steps, and say, it's all about me. What Jeremiah tells us is that for the sake of one another, we are called into the midst of the troublesome. We are called into the midst of a battle. And what Jesus reminds us is that this will be all around us. (laughs) But he gives us hope. He gives us hope, and he gives us a plan. He gives us a beacon. And he says, choose God, look for God, hear God, try to listen for his voice, obey him, put him first. You see, we like to love one another. We like to believe that we're good at it. But the truth of the matter is that we will fall short. The truth of the matter is that our life and the consequences of it are real. And just because we believe doesn't mean those will change. But what God does promise us is that even in the midst of insurmountable odds, of overwhelming factions, when everything seems like it's piled up against us, that he is there with us. He gives us the promise of eternity. He says that your soul will be taken care of. So go. He doesn't tell us to turn. He doesn't tell us to walk away. And he sure doesn't tell us to pretend it's something different. So this is the reality for us. We face a hard road. We face a culture that wants to explain away this faith, that wants to say what we're doing is just superstition, and there are people that want to say that we are limited in our understandings. I tell those people, let go. See what faith is like. Stop scratching and clawing for yourself and understand that there is a God who is drawing us into life in a way that we will truly find who we are. See, that's the beauty of it. When we let go, when we finally give it up to God, when we finally say, I can't do mother or fatherhood, I can't do brother or sisterhood, I can't do my job, I can't do 60 years of marriage without you. When we do that, we find that God has made us in a unique and beautiful way, that he has made us to be a Christian, a face of Christ, a little Christian, a little Christ in this world, to be a living example of Christ. But let's make no mistake about it. This will be a hard path. We need one another. We need to remind each other that the Holy Spirit is with us, that we love one another, that we are here for one another. I uh, actually heard this the other day, or actually yesterday, and I'll give credit to my father-in-law, actually, because he... It was a joke that when he said it, it was funny, and, and I, and I, but the more I thought about it, the more it fit right into the sermon. And um, I think it was a funny way of looking at it. There's a man who's walking in the woods, and he's hiking along, and he comes and he sees this grizzly bear. I'm going to botch it, I know, but I, I'll get it, most of the point right. So there's this bear coming up in the woods. He sees this grizzly bear, and it sees him, and it starts to charge at him, right? And this man gets down on his knees, and he prays before God, He says, dear God, please, please, please make that bear more of a Christian. Because he believed that somehow if he did that, that this bear would become soft, that this bear would all of a sudden become this kind of pacifistic, gentle creature. And so this bear, sure enough, gets up, it gets about 10 yards from him, and at that point gets up on his hind legs, puts his hands up in the air, and the bear prays, dear God, I give you thanks for the meal that you have prepared for me today. (laughs) You see, part of the realism of this faith is that we cannot look at a world that is edgy and has sharp edges. We cannot look at this place that is looking to hurt and maim and destroy, like those friends of Jeremiah that are just waiting for him to stumble so they can blow everything up. We must not pretend that we are living in Candyland. 
for this place that we are going into is harsh. The places and the relationships that God is calling us into are going to hurt. But our trust is that if we can do this in God, if we can do this from a heart of God, we can listen for him, believe that he is in the midst of that, that there truly is no circumstance that will ever truly overcome God. That we have a warrior standing beside us, that nothing else will overcome us. So this path is hard, and this path goes right into our heart of our home. We cannot turn around. There is no retreat, but there is a God who goes with us. Let us trust in that. Let us that be our courage. Amen.